Good morning, yes. We are here to worship our God, to lift up his name. We want to lift him higher. Welcome. I am so glad you're here. Are you glad you're here? Good. If not, change that. It's awesome. I'm so glad you're here. Turn to the people around you and greet them. Welcome to those of you watching online. We are glad you're watching.
ears keep cutting out. You know, Psalm 27 tells us, lift up your head, O you gates, and be lifted up ancient doors, and the king of glory will come in. It says, who is this king of glory? The Lord, strong and mighty. The Lord, mighty in battle. Church family, the, the battle is his. Amen. He's already won. And how do we join with him in that? Prayer praise, the blood of the lamb, the word of our testimony, right? All right. So let's raise up a standard this morning. I raise a hallelujah in the presence of my enemy. I raise a hallelujah Heaven comes to fight for me So I'm gonna sing In the middle of the storm Louder and louder You're gonna hear my praises roll Inside of me, with everything inside of me, I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. I will watch the darkness flee. I will watch the darkness flee. I raise a hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. In the middle of the mystery. A hallelujah. I raise a hallelujah. Fear you lost your hold on me. So I'm gonna sing in the middle of the storm. Louder and louder, you're gonna hear my praises roar up from the ashes.
Father, you are awesome in this place. I pray that your Holy Spirit would be set free to move amongst your people, to heal broken hearts, broken lives. We love you and we worship you this morning. Say 
gather in your presence and you are an awesome God you pour out your presence upon us in wonderful ways Lord I thank you that we can gather together and know and sense and feel and we your presence is awesome it's tangible it's something we can feel and we experience as we are in this room together you're here among us. And Father, your healing power is here to touch the lives of people. Whatever infirmity, whatever need, we don't have to beg you. We simply ask, as your word tells us, knowing that as, a, as you have promised, you would hear us and you would answer prayer. And so, Father, for every need in this room, if you have a need, would you just lift your hand right where you are? Whatever those needs are, physical, emotional, in families, in lives, in relationships, Father, in the name of Jesus, you're bigger and grander than any of the things that we would under ever need. Meet us in this moment right here right now I pray Father your healing touch would rest even as we speak let healing begin to flow through these bodies let, let sickness be gone let pain dissipate let, let restoring grace come into these lives Father we thank you for all that you're about to do we thank you for what testimonies we're going to hear of how you are continuously showing yourself strong and bringing healing to those that need it. Father, we ask this in Jesus' wonderful name. And while we're praying, Father, our hearts break as we think of what's happening in Israel. Your heart, Father, breaks when you see people that are so bound and so possessed to do deplorable things. And Father, we, we want to hold our rage and just simply ask that you would, would come in and meet the needs that are there. A mother, whether she's Jewish or Muslim, who has just lost a son, weeps and bears the same grief. And so, Father, we pray that you would come in these moments and, and begin to open eyes and hearts and ears to the Son of God and to the Prince of Peace. Give wisdom to leaders. Father, I pray in the name of Jesus that you would do what only you can in that region. And we'll thank you, Father, for all that you're going to do among us today. And all of God's people can say... Amen. May God bless you. You may be seated this morning. You love Jesus? Yes. Amen. I hope you do. He sure loves you. Amen. We want to uh, draw your attention, if you would, to the screen. We have some announcements we want to share this morning. Good morning, church family. We have a few announcements for you for this following week. 
There's still time to help out Trunk or Treat at the end of the month. Candy donations are still needed. You can find the trunk in the foyer. <laughs> Don't forget Operations Christmas Child is ongoing. They're the red and green boxes and the deadline to fill them will be November 12th. Thank you. Registration for the Kids Convention 1110 through 1111 in Salem. Flyers are available for you in the lobby. We're accepting cans and bottles for BGMC. Parents, don't forget, Kids Night is Wednesday from 6.30 to 8. In addition, high school through age 22 meet at the Stones House Sunday nights at 6.30. You can connect with us on social media. That's it for now, church. Have a wonderful Sunday. Registration. <laughs> You've never had to take two, have you? I remember doing some stuff when I was in Olympia. I had to be on TV for a thing, and it took 16 takes. <laughs> Amen. We're delighted that you're all here this morning, and what a great crowd. We had a wonderful crowd in first service, great spirit. Isn't it, isn't it fun to come to church and God shows up? Amen. Amen. And it's sweet to be here this morning. Just a couple of things, please. If you haven't signed up to be a trunk for our treats, we need you to do that, and uh, we're looking forward to that. You know, last year we had, between adults and kids, over 2,000 people come through the lot. And what an opportunity to have an impact on kids and on families. So please help us. We want to reach, we want to reach this city and especially our children for the Lord. Amen? amen. So every one of you that said amen, I expect a trunk. <laughs> we want to take an opportunity at this time to wait on you for our morning offering and ask the Lord's blessing on our gifts as we bring them together. Father, thank you for the privilege of sharing in the kingdom work here and around the world. And so I pray, Father, this morning that these gifts that we're about to receive help us with stewardship to be able to use them in a very wise and prudent way. We thank you, Father, for each gift and for every giver alike in Jesus' name. Amen and amen. I have an announcement to make this morning that I'm really excited to share. Uh, you know, we've had staff come and go uh, in the last year, and uh, there's a lot of things I'd like to be able to do, but because of not having adequate staffing, haven't been able to do some of those things. Well, we have extended an offer, an offer, a, a, an opportunity, and, and the offer, I guess, to a couple that have accepted that offer to become our executive associates with a portfolio of youth and worship. Amen? And here's the fun part. They will be here next Sunday. Their names are Mike and Lisa Brando. It's like Marlon Brando, but with a W. Okay. And uh, we're delighted to have them, a wonderful couple, experienced, well-rounded, and uh, they're just going to be a phenomenal ad addition to what we're doing here. I told them, I said, make sure you've got good shoes because this train has already left the station. And you're going to have to run to catch up. <laughs> so we're excited about having them. And, and I want you to welcome them well next week. And uh, we're going to look forward to a great time together. And I know that God's going to do some exciting, exciting things here as a result of having good team, good people, and all of you. Amen. It's interesting that God is doing something, not only there, but here as well. I, I've, I've just felt a sense of God's presence in the last few weeks and months, like I haven't for a long time. And talking with some of my friends across the country that are pastors, it's amazing that there's a stirring occurring across this country. I believe that God is about to do something remarkable. You know, we, we hear about revivals. Let me tell, tell you, revival is, is, is important. A revival is when a person, church, or Christian institution is lacking spiritual vitality to the point that they are in the throes of spiritual death 
And God restores that spiritual vitality. How many of you think we need revival? Well, let me tell you what, a, what an awakening is. A great awakening is a visitation of God on a city, county, region, or a country that affects the people spiritually, causing them to turn to God, which changes societal values, social interactions, and all of the dynamics of that culture. How many of you think America needs an awakening? Amen? <laughs> And I'm, I'm convinced of that. In this country, we have had four great awakenings. And I'm not going to bore you with a lot of history, but I want you to understand the, the foundation of this. Because what we see in Acts chapter 19 is an awakening moment that happened at the church there in the city of Ephesus. And it spread. It was exponential in what happened. The first great awakening was in 1730 to 1740, and it started with a man by the name of Jonathan Edwards, who was a pure preacher in Northampton, Massachusetts. In one of his sermons, he preached a sermon called Sinners in the Hands of an Angry God. He purposed to do it in a monotone voice because he did not want to, to have voice inflection in any way impact or challenge people. He wanted the word of God to speak to their heart. And there was such an anointing on that message that people at the end of that message were literally hanging onto the pews in fear of sliding into hell. That moment spread from Northampton all the way through the New England states. And it was an amazing move of God that occurred. The second great awakening was in 1810 to 1840. And at the latter end of that was a man by the name of Charles Finney. In the middle of it was a man by the name of Peter Cartwright. There were many individuals used. And, and God moved again and shook this nation to a spiritual awakening. There was a third one from 1880 to 1910. The end of that revival was what we would know as the Azusa Street Revival that happened in Los Angeles, California in 1906. It was a powerful move that went from 1906 to 1909. Through that, there was another woman evangelist. Her name was Mariah Woodard, uh, Woodward Etter, who had great meetings. She would have throngs of people come. Thousands of people came to Christ as a result of God's outpouring upon that time. Then there was the, latter, the last one that we've had was from 1960 to 1980. How many of you saw the Jesus Revolution film? Did you see that? That's depicting this last great awakening that happened. I'm a product of that great awakening. It was during that time where the baptism of the Holy Spirit and the Spirit of God was poured out in a mighty way in this country. It was a powerful thing. It went across denominational boundaries. I was raised conservative Baptist. I'm just a Bapticostal. But I remember, I remember watching God do things. I went to college and every once in a while on a Sunday night I would sneak over to an Episcopal church that was near I-5 in downtown Seattle. Dennis Bennett was the pastor of that church. Sunday mornings, it was a very liturgical, Episcopal church. At night, it was, a, it was an absolute riot to go into that church. Powerful, amazing anointing of God on that church. It, it was a move of God that knew no boundaries. And thousands, millions of people were brought into the kingdom of God as a result of that. What I see here in Acts chapter 19 was an epic moment where God came down literally in the city of Ephesus. Ephesus was a unique city. At that time, it was a city of about 250,000 people. It was the Roman seat of government for Asia Minor. It was a cultural center and it was a cultic center. It was, it was very demonic in many ways. Witchcraft, sorcery, all of the stuff that would go with that was a part of that culture. In verse 10, it says, these went out, this went on, Paul preaching. And I'll go back in a moment to, to, to bring that up. Paul was, was preaching and teaching. It says this went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. I want to show you something on the map because it kind of gives you an understanding. Paul was here at Antioch. He went all the way up here to, to Ephesus. That's about 680 miles by foot. And some of you complain at Fred Myers. <laughs> all right. 
But while he was here, there was this amazing outpouring of God. It was a powerful thing. It didn't happen overnight. For two years, literally day and night, he's preaching the word. He's teaching people about the gospel. He's teaching people about Jesus. And what happens is he disciples people, and they go up here to Pergamos, to Thyatira, to Philadelphia, to Smyrna, to all of these different places that you would read in Revelation 3 and 4 to the seven churches in the book of Revelation. All of those came out of this move of God that happened at Ephesus. I I love that concept that God would move in a city and the impact of that would impact a whole region. This, this whole area of what you see Asia going into Pamphylia is all modern day Turkey. What's really ironic is Turkish revisionistic history does not teach what the Bible teaches us about Ephesus. Many Ephesians, many people in in Turkey wouldn't even understand that Ephesus had this impact at that particular point in time. But for two years he preached. It's, It's a powerful thing to me. And in this preaching, this, this city, it was, they, they had what was called the Ephesian letters. These were spells that were printed and would be put down into small little rolls, put into a, a little cylinder worn around the neck as an amulet or as, a, as, as some kind of a locket. And these were there to protect from demons and evil spirits, they, they thought. Kind of like what the New Age has today. Paul comes in and he simply teaches the word of God. I loved how Jeremy shared that, that when, this, when Barnabas was talking about the hands and feet and he was able to take him to the word, the word became alive and the word validated that. You see, we, we, we live by the word of God. Amen. The word of God is our hope. The word of God is our strength. The word of God is our foundation. The word of God is what we base our life on. Can you say amen to that? So looking at this, there were three thoughts that the Lord spoke to me about a great awakening. First of all, a great awakening is based on the word of God. If people are awakened to the true God, they have to know who he is. And the word of God tells us who he is. Amen. Amen. I I had a fellow in our first service that a few few months ago didn't know much about God. But he's learning every week. Oh, there's a lot of questions. He has all kinds of questions. I love the questions. And we're able to just share the word of God. It's the word of God. I just love it when you see people respond to God's word. Amen. Amen. The, the, the word gives us the description of what we need and how we are to believe. Acts 19 verse 8 says, Paul entered the synagogue and spoke boldly there for three months, arguing persuasively about the kingdom of God. You see, when you go into a synagogue, they don't have extemporaneous messages. They take a portion of the law, first five books of the Bible, a portion of the prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel. They will take a portion of the Psalms. And then at the end of all of that, a rabbi will tell them what they have heard. This is what Paul would do. He would come into the synagogue. These portions of scripture would be read from the prophets, from the law, and from from the Psalms. And then Paul would say, and all of this points to one person, Jesus. All scripture points to Christ. All scripture leads to Jesus. And this is what he was teaching. Out of of their scriptures, he was showing them Jesus is their Savior. It's a powerful thing. Verse 9 says, And some, but some of them became obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. You see, they were called followers of the way because they would say, This is the way to God through Jesus Christ. Jesus said, I have the way, the truth, and the life. And so they were known as people of the way. Before they were called Christians in this part of the world, they were followers of the way. It's interesting in verse 9, it goes on, it says, So Paul Paul left them because some of them become obstinate. They refused to believe and publicly maligned the way. So Paul left them and took disciples with him and had discussions daily in the lecture hall of Tyrannus. It's interesting that Paul would work in the morning as a leather worker, as a tent maker, And about 11 o'clock in the morning, 
he would go into the, the, the hall of Tyrannus and he'd begin to teach. He taught from 11 o'clock to 4 in the afternoon. Well, why would he do that? Because that was the time when they had a siesta. It's hot there. They didn't have air conditioning. They didn't have those luxuries that we have today. They would work in the cool of the morning and they would work later in the afternoon in the cool of the evening. But in the middle of the day, they took off. I call it siesta seminars. And so he would begin to teach. He taught them the word of God. He would go in and he would discuss the word. He would teach them what God's word was saying. He would teach them about Christ. They were learning literally day and night. We go to the next chapter, chapter 20. We find that at 11 o'clock at night, he's teaching. So morning and night, in, in the day, he, day or night, doesn't matter. He's teaching the word of God. For two years, he's teaching the word of God. Now he's discipling people and they're going all over part, that part of of Asia sharing Christ. It was a powerful moment. Revivals or awakenings begin with the Word of God. I, I, I don't come to give you book reports. I come to share the Word of God with you. I will drown you in the Word of God. Sometimes people say, well, there's so many scriptures. Good, read them. Why? Because it's the word of God that is going to be solid for your life. It's the word of God that's going to establish your life. It's the word of God that will show you the way in which you are to go. I'm not here to talk about hot topics or the latest things. I'm here to tell you about Jesus and his word. Secondly, awakening and the supernatural. Those two things seem to go together in, in all of the Bible, New Testament to this present day. Supernatural healings became prevalent and casting out of demons was something that was normal. Jesus said to his disciples, I want you to go out, heal the sick, raise the dead and cast out devils. Those were the things he told his disciples to do. And he said this to them. He said, the things that I do, you shall do also. And even greater than these, because I go to my father and he's going to send you the empowerment to do that. Amen. How many of you know that's a pretty good deal? All we have to do is say yes, and Jesus does the doing. Amen? I'm in contact with pastors from all over this country. And one of the things that I am hearing, doesn't matter whether it's here in Oregon, on the West Coast, all over this country, I'm hearing the same thing. There's a stirring going on in our church. There's a stirring going on in our community. Something is happening. People are coming to the Lord. People are, are, are being baptized. We're seeing people receive the, the infilling of the Holy Spirit. We're watching people come to Christ. We've had more people baptized in the last couple of months than we've had in a long time. We're seeing people come to Jesus that people have told me there's no way that person would ever, ever cross the threshold of a church. You know what? God knows what he's doing. Amen. And he is working into the hearts of every person. We only look at the outside. God is dealing with them on the inside. He's speaking to them. He's challenging them. There are questions. There are concerns. And I believe God is orchestrating all of that. And all we have to do is tell them about Jesus. I like that low hanging fruit. Amen. And God has that in mind. Verse 10 and 11 says, They went on for two years so that all the Jews and Greeks who lived in the province of Asia heard the word of the Lord. But here's the other thing that hits me. And God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Extraordinary miracles? Well, what's the difference between an ordinary miracle and an extraordinary miracle? Look at that word, extraordinary. That means that Though there are ordinary miracles, there's something that's even extra beyond the ordinary. I, I have this quizzical mind. What's the difference? Years ago, I had some people that I brought up from Argentina. Claudio and Betty Frazen. They were part of, of a great move of God that happened in Argentina. There was a move of God where there was this, literally, there was this awakening that happened in Argentina that at the point in time when it began, 5% of the Argentines were considered evangelical Pentecostal Christians. At the end of that revival, that went from 5% to 15% of the nation was impacted 
with that. Hundreds and thousands and millions of people came to know Christ as a result of it. And what accompanied that were miracles. And he would tell me, he's, <laughs> I remember him saying, we had, we had miracles and then we had big miracles. Ordinary miracles, extraordinary miracles. Well, tell me, what's, what's an ordinary miracle? Oh, healing of cancer. You know, somebody had a broken bone and it was healed instantaneously. Well, that's pretty exciting to me. That's extraordinary to me. So what's an extraordinary miracle? Well, he said an extraordinary miracle would be if you had a problem with your knee and God healed it. That'd be an ordinary miracle. But if you didn't have a leg and God restored the whole limb, that's extraordinary. Pastor, do you believe that? It happened in the Bible. You remember the story of the withered hand? The original language is he had no hand. God gave him a new hand. God grew a new limb. Hey, listen, God, he's the manufacturer of the original equipment. Amen. All right. A, an extraordinary miracle is if somebody had to have part of their lung removed because of cancer. And all of a sudden that lung was restored to vital health. I'd consider that extraordinary miracle. He said, here's the one that really got me. He said, in this, mir in this moment of extraordinary miracles, we had people, men, that were bald. And all of a sudden, after this, they grew a full head of hair. <laughs> so here's my idea. Take a before and after picture. <laughs> Amen, brother. We, we want that. Amen. What I'm trying to say is that God still does the miraculous. Verse 12 says, so that even handkerchiefs and aprons that had touched him were taken to the sick and their illnesses were cured and evil spirits left them. Television has done some da damage to the work of the kingdom because there have been some, I'm going to call them what they are, shoddy evangelists that say, you send me this much money and I'll send you this kind of oil or I'll send you this cloth. You don't need to send money. Here's the thing. It wasn't the cloth and it wasn't the oil on the cloth that healed the person. It was the power of faith behind that moment. You know, the Bible says, is any among you sick? Let them call for the elders of the church that we can anoint them with oil and, and pray the prayer of faith. It isn't the oil and it's not the hands. It's the power of a living God that is still a miracle working God. I, I love this testimony. Mariah Woodward Ather shares this story that this, this occurred in one of her meetings. This was a letter sent to her. She said, I sent an anointing handkerchief, an anointed handkerchief to my mother, Mrs. J.J. Mason in St. Clair, Tennessee. She fell off a porch 15 years ago and a washing machine fell on her, which caused her to be an invalid ever since as her limbs withered away. As soon as the kerchief touched her, she was immediately healed and is praising God for it all. This same handkerchief was then sent to Mrs. P.C. Phillips in Chicago, who had been crippled by rheumatism. She also was instantaneously healed and praising God. The days of miracle certainly are not over. I believe God does a miraculous. And I'm not saying that we have to go around sending nap napkins or handkerchiefs or whatever. I just simply believe this. My God hears prayer. He answers prayer. He's still a God that does the miraculous. Can you say amen? How many of you know of someone or yourself, God has touched you, healed you, delivered you? See, God is still alive, folks. Amen. 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 The, the third thing that hits me is this. It says, some Jews went about driving out the evil spirits, trying to invoke the name of the Lord. Jesus over them who were demon possessed and they would say in the name of Jesus whom Paul preached I command you to come out Dr. Randy Clark has a book biblical guidebook to deliverance and in it he makes this statement is it that is casting out of demons dangerous yes is it forbidden no but it definitely is not for the average Christian. It should be the domain of those invited by the Holy Spirit who are living in holiness and whose faith for the battle is supplied by the Holy Spirit. 
Jesus said, don't fear those that can destroy the flesh, but fear him that has power to destroy the spirit. You see, he was saying to us, we need to be careful. God is powerful, but Satan isn't as powerful as God. Amen? Amen. He says to us that we can cast out demons. We can do that. But remember this. In Luke's gospel, Jesus makes the statement, be careful when you go casting out demons because they go seeking a place for rest. In other words, if... If they can't find a place, they might come back to the place they left. If it's not filled with the presence of God. It's not a, it's not a lark. It's not something foolish. It's something that's real and is very profound. It goes on in verse 14. The seven sons of Sceva. I love this. this. This is the first biblical reference to streakers in the Bible. The seven sons of Sceva, Jewish priests, were doing this. They were, they were going out, casting out devils in the name of Jesus, whom Paul preached. That's how they did it. It says, Jesus I know. This demon speaks back. says, Jesus I know, and I know about Paul, but who are you? And then he pounced on them. He overwhelmed them. He beat them to a pulp. He pantsed them and shook them outside. I can just, I'd almost like to see part of that. Y'all, y'all understand what I'm saying? That, you don't go messing around with it, but there's a power that we have. And the last thing I want to share is this, awakening and repentance. When God begins to move, there is the weight of his presence that you sense. And when you sense the presence of God, as a believer, the first thing that's jettisoned is sin. We don't want anything there. We want to make sure we're right with God. And that's exactly what happened in Ephesus. There was this power of God, this weight of God, this presence of God. It's ironic because the, the, the Hebrew word for glory means weight, heaviness. You ever, some of you hippies remember, that was heavy, man. You remember, you remember that statement? Well, that's heavy, man. That's the weight of God. It's the glory of God. It's his presence that comes down. And when it comes down, it's overwhelmed. Isaiah said it well. He said, he said, in the year King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord and his train filled the temple. And then in verse 5, he makes this statement, I am damned. Woe to me means I am damned. I am a man. I am ruined for I am a man of unclean lips. And I live among people of unclean lips and my eyes have seen the king the lord almighty when when you sense the weightiness of god what you sense are two things one you sense how incomplete you are how imperfect you are how flawed you are I don't care how long you've served Jesus. I don't care if you preached for 400 years. When you come into the presence of God, you realize your weakness, your vulnerability, your, your, your flaws. But at the same moment, you're also overwhelmed by the incredible love that he has at the same time. It's almost a juxtaposition, isn't it? You sense your unworthiness and you sense his overwhelming love. To the point that as a believer, it brings us to a point, God, I want you to cleanse me. This was Isaiah. Lord, I'm a man of unclean lips, so what's he do? The angel, a seraphim, comes, goes and grabs a coal off the altar, purges his lips to cause him to have righteousness again. But to the unrighteous, when the weight of God happens, it's like those in Northampton Church. They hung onto the pews in fear of sliding right straight into hell. It causes great fear. It's interesting that when, when a move of God happens, it changes not just the church. You see, a move of God is too big to constrain inside these four walls. If we're going to have an awakening, we want it to go out of these walls, into this city, into this region. You know what I want? I want the power of God to go from Florence, Oregon, into weird Eugene, and into weirder Portland. 
Can you say amen to that? Just like it left Ephesus and it went into all of these cities. May God let it happen. Let it happen. Does it happen that way? Benjamin Franklin was not, he would be, I would call him an irreligious man. And in his autobiography, he wrote this of George Whitfield in Philadelphia. In 1739, arrived among us from England, the Reverend Mr. Whitfield, who had made himself remarkable there in England as an itinerant preacher. He was at first permitted to preach in some of the churches, but the clergy, taking a dislike to him, soon refused him their pulpits. And he was obliged to preach in the fields. They tell us that when he would go out into the fields, they would have as many as five to 20,000 people in those fields. And he would stand on a, on a stump and preach the word of God. And the power of God was so real. And the presence of God was so real. Many of them fell to their knees in, in, in crying for fear of God's judgment. Wanted God's salvation. They came to Christ by the droves. And he goes on and he says this. I love this. It was wonderful to see the change soon made in the manner of behavior in our inhabitants. From being thoughtless and indifferent about religion, it seemed as if all the world were growing religious so that one could not walk through the town, Philadelphia, in an evening without hearing songs sung in different families on every street. Wow. Let me tell you, what an awakening does when people live by faith Sherry's father Lewis Hoopman was raised in a in a pastor's home his mother and father were pastors and missionaries his grandmother Stone was a product of the Azusa Street Revival she was a preacher in her own right he was raised in this influence. He went off to the Navy and he backslid, got away from God. Grandpa and Grandma Hoopman were pastoring a little church in Venita, Oregon. It's now the bakery. What do they call that? Heaven sent bakery or some kind of thing. I remember. But if you've been to Venita, it's there. It's this it's that's the church that they pastored. Dad was backslidden. He was away from God. And he, was, he, was, he had a dance band. He was playing in a house. And one of the guys in this house, when he was playing, says, Hoot, you know church hymns. Play us a hymn. And he started to play a hymn. The Spirit of God came all over him. He quit playing. He said, take me to my dad's church. He went into the church. He said, go get my dad. And Grandpa Hootie came over and prayed dad into the kingdom of God. Cast demons out of him. But let me tell you the rest of the story. Grandma took a sheet. Grandpa used to take bed sheets and he would do illustrated messages and timelines and prophecy and all that stuff. And it was, they didn't have all of this. So one of these sheets, half of it had a depiction of hell and the other half had a depiction of heaven. Grandma, under the auspices of God, took that sheet and wrapped his bed, a single, you know, just a single, what do they call it, just a twin bed, wrapped it in that sheet with hell up and then made his bed over the top of it. Dad would tell me, and then she prayed, she prayed, oh, she prayed that her son would come to Jesus Dad told me years later, he said, because I was asking about his testimony, he says, you know, I didn't know this for a long time about Grandma doing that to his bed. But he said, for months, I didn't sleep because I had visions of hell every night when I closed my eyes. Coincidence? I don't think so. You see, when God comes down, he comes down because there are people that want him to come down. He comes down because there are people that are hungering for the things of God. He comes down when he sees 
people that have been given horrible diagnosis, when they have problems in their life, when there's marriage issues, when kids are astray, if there's ever a day for God to come down in this country, it's today. When we have so much malignment, when we have so much distortion, we have so many lies being told our kids. I watched yesterday on the news what's going on in Columbia University and Harvard University and some of our major universities. I, I began, because I've got this quizzical mind, what causes this? It's when the federal government supports sponsors that go on our campuses that promote Hamas, Hezbollah, and all of the diatribical reasons that are coming out of Iran. And our, our faculty members, paid by our government, are brainwashing our kids to this filth. If I had my way... I'd take my taxes and I'd put it to a personal aspect of community involvement and not let those jokers mess with my money. But if I did that, I'd have to start a jail ministry. <laughs> that might not be a bad idea. But the point of what I'm saying is, what will change it? The power of of God will change it. So how do we end this service? I want you to stand with me because I think there are two things that we can learn from this. At least I feel strongly about it. The first thing is we need to get right and get ready spiritually. Do, do you understand what that means? That means we need to pray more. We need to fast more. We need to get our houses in order more. What is it that we have allowed to creep into our homes? What is it that we have allowed to come into our, our families and into our kids and into our own lives? Peter, the night Jesus was betrayed, when Jesus took the basin and the towel and he was going to wash the disciples' feet, and, and, and Peter said, no, you're not going to do that. Jesus, that's beneath you. You're not going to do that. But Peter, if you don't allow me to do this, you have no part of me in the kingdom. Then give me a bath. No, Peter. You see, what Jesus was saying was simple. As a believer, we walk in an ungodly world. And the residue of this ungodly world can cling to our souls. And it can do to us what corrosion does to a battery. And we lose the connection to the power because of the stuff that collects upon that point of contact. There are things in our homes that we don't need. There are things in your life that you need to make an inventory on. I'm not telling you what they are. I'm not going to get into all of that. Because I think we can get into booger men that aren't there. The point of what I'm saying is that there's an attachment of hell. If there's an attachment of anything ungodly, we don't need that in our home. Hello? Well, they want my television. No. But do but you follow what I'm trying to say? We need to take an inventory. We need to... How, what was, when, where was the last time you took a season of fasting? When was the last time that you, you honestly prayed for more than your food? Can I ask you this question? Are you living in such a way where God can use you to do, the, to do the dynamic work that he wants done. We can hear about pastor praying for somebody and they're healed. We can hear about somebody else praying, but what about you? I believe that God wants to use every single one of us for the work of the kingdom. He wants to pour out his spirit upon all flesh. I love it where it says, they that believe they can lay hands on the sick it doesn't say whether they're a clergy. It doesn't say whether they're a deacon. It doesn't say whether they're... It doesn't... It, they believe. How many of you believe? You're a candidate for God to do extraordinary things. I believe God wants to do that one more time. And secondly, pray for our city. I don't pastor this church. I pastor this city. 
Yes, I, I preach here. But I live out there. Let's get it out there, church. Let's be the bread to our city that they're starving for. Let's be the witness. Pay your bills on time. Be honorable to your word. Be kind to people. Don't cuss out that person that cuts you off. I know that's hard. Somebody said, do preachers cuss? Not out loud. <laughs> do you understand what I'm trying to say? Live it. Be it. Do it. So, Father, Holy Spirit, would you reveal to us those things that might be in any way a proclivity to the Word of God, to our witness? Those things that would hinder your moving in and through our lives? Those things that cause this corrosiveness that we've lost connection. Holy Spirit, show us. Show us habits and attitudes. Show us behaviors. Show us those things, God. And help us. Forgive us. Release us from those things. In Jesus' name. How many of you this morning, heads bowed, eyes closed, but you be honest before God and you say, Pastor, that's spoken to me this morning. I do not want one thing to hinder me from my walk with God or my ability to reach people. Would you just lift that hand at Jesus? Father, you see these hands. You see these lives. We, we could all lift our hands because, Father, there's, all, there's something all of us. We need you. Holy Spirit, we need you. We need the empowerment of your spirit. We need the zealousness of your spirit. We need the word of God stronger than ever before. Father, lead us into times of prayer. Lead us in moments of fasting. Lead us, Lord, into a life that draws others to you. I pray your blessing over each one. Now, Father, if there be one person watching by, 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 by Internet, listening on radio, or here this morning that has not made that commitment to you, Father, I'm asking you, Holy Spirit, speak to their heart. If you're here this morning and you know without a doubt that you're not right with God and you want to be right with God and you need Jesus as your Savior, don't you think it's time to respond? Don't you think it's time to say yes? And this morning, I'm going to ask you to do something. You're serious? God didn't... You, you didn't ap happen here accidentally. God drew you to this moment. And he drew you here because he loves you, cares about you, has a plan for you. That plan starts by asking him to be Lord and Savior of your life. And if that's you this morning, would you join me in this simple prayer? Everybody praying it together. Would you do that with me? Lord Jesus, I need you. I need your help. Forgive me of my sins. Heal my heart. Cleanse my walk. I accept you as my Lord and Savior. And Holy Spirit, I need your help. I need the power of your spirit to help me to live out my faith. I need you right now. In Jesus' name, I declare you as my Savior. Declare me your child. In Jesus' name. How many of you prayed that prayer and you meant it? Can I see your hands? Oh, man. Man, oh, man, oh, man. In just a moment, we're going to dismiss after we give a blessing. But you know, I know that there are needs that people have. And I know the hour. But some of you just need somebody to pray with you. Circumstances, situations, maybe healing, maybe an issue. I don't know what it is. You know what it is. And I'm going to ask my board and my, my leaders to come. And my, those of you that know how to pray, I want you to come. And we're going to take a moment. And we're going to pray for you before you leave. And we're going to trust God 
to begin the awakening that God desires in this place. Anybody, anybody happy for that? Amen. Amen. Would you lift your hands for his blessing? And now, Father, bless your people. Bless them, keep them, guide them, direct them, encourage them, empower them. May your peace, may your goodness, may your hope, may your vision be theirs. Bless them in their labor, in their leisure, in their working, in all of the aspects of their life. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you give God a big hand this morning? May the Lord bless you. Have a great week. If you need prayer, join us, please. We'd love to pray with you.